Yes, uh, sir. So anyway, uh, my slaughter room. And as you can see, what I like is cap officer sabers. I collect uh, about 1840, about 1860, and what I can find in the 33 Dragoon sabers. All Ames, and I'll also collect Tiffany's. So what we're going to talk about today are what I consider to be the golden period of American swords, which uh, began about 1830 and ended about 1865. The reason why I call it the golden age is before this period, uh, my two men and wife over here are going to pick up the swords. They both collect the earlier stuff, the iron hilted stuff. To me, it's very unattractive. <laughs> I like the brass, I like the silver, I like the glitzy, glitzier stuff. The other thing is that during this period, swords were actually used. They were used on the frontier, they were used in American forts, uh, and they were used in conflict of arms, both in uh, the first real major conflicts we had with uh, Native Americans, American Indians in Florida and elsewhere on the frontier, and also uh, the war with Mexico, and then of course our Civil War. So we're going to talk about the model of 1834, the model of 1840, the model of 1850, the model of 1860. What's interesting is you'll find here we've got a 25 to 30 year period where we had a lot of different swords come across. And, and the initial beginning, the model of 1834, the reason why the government came up with the model of 1834 was in 1820 the last regulation was so general that any, anybody could carry almost anything. Uh, if you're an officer, as long as it was the right color, silver for infantry, uh, guilt for mounted officers or, or dragoons or um, uh, uh, artillery, you were all set. Well, that uh, led to a, a lot of different varieties of swords being carried by officers. And infantrymen, in the case of dragoons, carried an iron hilted uh, saber that carries uh, NCOs. Uh, they carried a single strapped iron saber, very unattractive, uh, generally usable. Uh, but the officer swords were typically not usable, they were more for show. And in 1834, the government decided they needed government-wide, army-wide patterns. So they came up with a pattern of 1834. In 1840, they realized that the models of 1834 weren't substantial enough. And what they did was they sent a group of officers to Europe to evaluate ordnance in Europe. That, in that includes uh, firearms, cannons, and swords. And those officers came back and recommended a series of, a series of patterns for, in 1840. And then the government decided in 1850 that the models of 1840 needed to be upgraded. And that's why we have the model of 1850. And then in 1860, only two new swords came out. And they were the model of um, 1850, 1860 staff sword and the cavalry saber. So as we proceed here, the first of the model of 1830 swords was a 32 foot artillery. Vanna White, the two Vannas over here, and pull them up. And so this first sword is the model of 1832 foot artillery. It's uh, it's a sword that's the longest used sword in the American inventory. The sword was introduced in 1832, made manufactured by Ames, and was used through the 1880s. Initially, it was foot artillery and NCOs, and in 1840, it became only foot artillery. So this is the sort of sword that you would have seen an artilleryman in a fort, like right here, or uh, would have been used by heavy artillery in the field, and I think more often than not it was probably used to uh, cut brush, help dig in placements, uh, make your fascines and gabions and that sort of thing. But artillerymen loved it, it was a good looking sword, and they kept it forever. And what, with this particular sword is the early artillery belt. So the other models of 1834 and people say that the model of 1832, not the model of 1834, but let me correct it. In my book, I explain why it's model 34. Dick Johnson was the first one to identify the fact that even though the dress regulation of 1832 called for a new sword, no sword had been picked out at that point. The swords actually weren't brought to the United States until 33, and the actual patterns weren't developed until 1834. So the first one was this boat shell guard um, infantry officer sword. Uh, this particular sword was carried by 
infantry officers, and here's an example of uh, a slightly different one. The leather scabbard with the brass mounts were for infantry officers. The brass scabbard was for general officers and staff, off staff officers. The sword is fairly flimsy. Uh, the grip is silver, a very thin sheet of silver over a wood core, uh, and the uh, pommel cap splits in two. You can unscrew it and the whole thing comes apart. Definitely not a battle weapon. And they figured that out early on uh, when they were in Florida and the things were falling apart. <laughs> Uh, and part of the model of 1834 was that the Army decided that they would have separate swords for infantry officers, staff officers, and also the special services, in this case the engineers, pay department, metal work department. They had a very light sword, obviously never meant to be used in, in, in uh, self-defense or combat. It was for show. Very pretty sword. And uh, in the, uh, the letter from, to, from Maycomb, in 1833, when he writes to uh, the Ordnance Department suggesting this sword, he said it, it, um, that the gentlemen of the services should appreciate them. So clearly it was never meant to be anything but a gentleman's sword. Okay, so the other model of the 30s was a Dragoon Saber, and Chris is holding it up now. This particular one, if you want to look at it afterwards, is kind of rare. It actually says United States Dragoons on the blade. I think there, there are like three of these known. Uh, this particular sword was developed and in 1833. I think the first one was actually sold in 1834. If you have my book, uh, the, well, there's a sheet in there showing the actual purchase orders of the first swords and who got them and where they went. And I've done the same thing in, in the second book. The first book, the blue covered book, is only on sabers. The second one is on infantry swords and all the other special services. And I have the actual order books in there from AIM, so you can see who actually bought the swords, where they were shipped, who got them, that sort of thing. The problem with this sword was, it's a real pretty sword, it was already, in my opinion, was outdated when it was adopted by the government. It was outdated, and well first of all it was adopted because those first swords of 1830 were all British patterns. Here's another British pattern, a British pattern of 1822, and uh, it was already outdated at the point when we adopted it. Uh, the British realized at that point that they didn't like the particular sword. Uh, the scabbard was very thin and weak, dented very easily. Um, this is a, an example of what well, you can see the scabbard is, is nothing special. And the blade is a pipe back blade, has no fuller. So it was, uh, you can see the copy of the blade here. It was, it was both a slashing uh, weapon, but it was also meant for the thrust. And when you, when you thrusted with a sword, occasionally the blade would bend wiggle. It wasn't stiff enough. And so if you ran up against somebody with a heavy coat on and you tried to stab them with this thing, uh, it was going to be a problem. The Dragoons didn't like it. Nobody really liked it. But in fact, a lot of them were made. Most of them were purchased by militia, state militia units. And um, the Army continued to buy these until 39. Uh, Texas got one, got uh, a bunch of them hung on them by Ames in 1839 and 1840. So the scarcest of these things are marked Texas Dragoons on the blade. I have one of those, and believe me, it took me years and years and years to find one. The other states that are marked, South Carolina, bought them. The South Carolina hilt is smooth, looks like a bird's head, and it says South Carolina on the blade. If you see one South Carolina blade, it's very, very scarce because that blade marking typically didn't last very long because it was inscribed with a dry needle. What that means is the blade was covered with uh, asphaltum, which is like a, a, a wax. And then they took a, a very sharp instrument and they wrote whatever they wanted to write through the wax onto the metal. Then they dipped it in acid and they took the wax off and what you had left over was whatever was written on the blade. Um, it was typically not very deep, didn't last long, so in many cases these blades are, are, are very difficult for, to, to see the, the inscriptions. And South Carolina one almost impossible. North Carolina marked their blade on the quill, and that's that little thing that sticks, sticks around the top, and it says NC. Those are also pretty scarce. Uh, the Pennsylvania ones are pretty scarce. Uh, occasionally you'll find one of those marked with a big P. Uh, and none of the other ones are marked in any particular way. Kentucky bought them, South Carolina bought them, Georgia bought them, North Carolina bought them, Pennsylvania, Ohio. A lot of militia units had the swords, but only those very few states actually marked them. Uh, hard one to find, very scarce. I, I have a soft spot in my heart for these things. Um, the topographical engineers, 
1839 decided that they wanted to use this old pattern sword because they had one of these small sword gentleman type swords. What they ended up uh, deciding was that those small sword gentleman swords weren't very good for topographical engineers. These were the guys that went on the Western expeditions. So when they went on the Western expeditions and they figured out they were talking to the Indians and crossing rivers and fighting off attacking buffaloes, <laughs> those little small swords weren't going to be very much help. So they decided to go with what was then the uh, Dragoon Saber, but they wanted it different. They added a branch, as you can see, there's three branches. And uh, it's, it, the scabbard is a little heavier, but other than that, it's pretty much the same. Uh, TE for topographical engineer in that heart-shaped uh, United States plaque at the throat uh, is, is a separator. It also says topographical engineers on the blade. These, these swords are almost non-existent. Okay, so model of 1840, let's talk about those. We know that the 33 was the first, the first military-wide group of swords that were identified by the government for all the different various units. They decided that, as I mentioned, the Dragoon sword wasn't that great. The infantry sword was terrible. They needed something different. So they came up with in 1840, they sent those officers to Europe. They came back from Europe with recommendations on swords. The recommendations were a French pattern for artillery and for uh, cavalry and, and a British pattern modified and updated for the infantry. So let's talk about the artillery ones first. Up until now, the artillery didn't have a saber. They were carrying those, those swords we saw earlier. And if you're a mounted artilleryman, light artillery, and you were carrying um, one, of, one, of, uh, one, of, one of these things, that wasn't going to last, especially in a leather scabbard. So they wanted a hardy, heavy saber, and they got one. And that's what John DePue is holding up over here. It's a heavy saber, it's flat back, has a fuller running in, almost to, to six inches or eight inches of the tip, leather grip, brass bound. The one on the right, well, first of all, the one on the left is, is, is an Ames, and, and the one on the right is an Ames. Um, the one on the right is an officer veins. That particular one uh, is, is near and dear to my heart because I own it. It has a silver foil scabbard and it has a guy's name on the blade. Um, and oh wait, yeah, guy's name on the blade. Ames didn't make these until 1844-45. The first ones were actually purchased by from SK, Schnitzel and Kirschbaum and Solingen in Germany, and they'll be marked like that on the right. The RC with the crown and the D and the S and K, and of when they when they purchased those swords, purchased those sabers, I should say, those early ones will say S and K at the Ricasso or on the spine. They're very hard to find. In 1839, the government held trials of sabers. They like this one, and so some of them will actually have a 39 on there. Those are really rare, very hard to find. Uh, the ones that are that will have a 40 on there. Uh, are also pretty scarce. Typically, they're not marked with a date. They only have that uh, marking that I showed you there. Oh, there you go. So anyway, these are the these are the cabinet artillery sabers. There's a guy actually holding one. Uh, I don't particularly believe that's the way he was in the field. He certainly wasn't carrying the shoulder scales. That was a nice, pretty picture. Within about six months, I mean, that thing was pretty ready at that point. Probably had holes in his knees, and, but he was still carrying the saber. And early on. Um, beginning of the Civil War, most of our guys didn't have pistols. They were actually just carrying sabers. So this saber was used war with Mexico on the frontier and then Civil War. And in 1872 it was superseded, so it was carried up until 1872 by light artillery units. Okay, cavalry saber. This is the model of 1840 also. The other, the, um, the defining feature of the model of 1840 cavalry saber is the blade back is flat. The later ones are rounded, the earlier ones are rounded. And Vanna White here will show you a, a blade back that's flat. This is not one of the uh, SMKs. This happens to be an Ames, uh, and uh, it happens to be one of first year of production, and it was probably never used. It was in a, a warehouse or an armory or some, someplace until Dick Johnson got it, and I got it from Dick. But they're usually not in that kind of condition. <laughs> so the early ones are SMK. Ames made the first one here in 1845, and that's what this one's made. Okay, John, move on then. So that's the cavalry saber, or the saber at that point, and the artillery. 
Now we get into uh, the small swords that were updated from the 33s. And what we have here is medical staff and pay department. And this was a design by Captain Washington Hood, who was with the Topographical Engineers. And it's based on a design that the state of Virginia had designed for their War of 1812 heroes. And the, War of Eight, the, the Virginia ones were, are solid gold. And uh, the, the, uh, the US Army liked them so much, they decided to have a, have a the same basic, basic pattern made for medical staff and, and pay department gentlemen, and of course they were brass with gold gilt. MS for medical staff, and it would be PD for pay department, and the blades would also be marked medical staff and pay department. They also used this design as a presentation design during um, the period of the War with Mexico. I happen to have one that was presented to a, a colonel on his way to the War with Mexico. It doesn't have MS or PD on it. It was just a, it was such a, a beautiful sword at that time. They decided to uh, to use it for presentation. This pay department is marked white in this placard here, and the medical department is marked the same way. The initials, as John said, are the PD. This is the pay department sword. I'll hand that to the medical staff which is on that one. So then we go to model 1840 engineer small sword. Now this one's very interesting because it's uniquely American. Nothing European about the sword at all. The reason why I say that is if a band moves her head out of the way, sorry. <laughs> uh, that grip is a rattlesnake wound around, wound around the center. And that's his, see the, the snake's head is at the, at the very top on the left. Can you point that out, Van? Oh, wait, wait. I have a little thing here I can point with. Right there. That's the snake's head. That's the rattle down there. And that's the coiled snake. And that right there is the castle right there for the engineers. And there's the star right there. And uh, the, the scabbard has the uh, United States shield right there. Uniquely American, uh, the, uh, the uh, engineers decided they were going to do something different than everybody else. They weren't going to use some European model. And it's, it's, this happens to be a fairly rare sword. It's a beautiful sword. But it's, once again, it was never meant to, to be used in the field. And as you can see, it has a triangular blade. OK, now this is the sword the model of 1840 swords that went to infantry officers, staff officers, and to uh, officers of uh, general officers. And John has one here on my left. And this particular one is an SNK. And when SNK when S was contracted by the US government, the government bought artillery, cavalry, infantry officers, and NCO and musician swords from SNK. This is one of the infantry officer swords that was purchased in 1839 and brought over here in 1840. Further making this one unique was the fact that this is one of the 50 that was, uh, not one of the 50, one of the 100 infantry officer swords purchased, but only one of 10 that has an officer's name on the plate. So that was a pretty neat sword to get. Uh, this pattern, oops, let me go back. Yeah. This yeah. pattern right here, this pattern right here is a general officer's pattern based on the model of 1840. And if Vanna can go down there, hey, can I just pick up the right general here? officer, sir. You got it right there? Here. Okay. This, mm, Vanna can come out here. You want me to open up the Yeah, leave it, leave, it, leave it flopped over. You can see it has a silver grip, faceted. And at the very top here is a cap that's called a capstan nibble, and it stands stands high, as you can see. That is typically European. American swords didn't have that tall capstan rivet. They were flat, like the um, earlier S and Ks. See how they were flat? The European, like some of the other makers, have a capstan rivet on top. So. This particular model, even though it's an 1840 general officer sword, was presented in 1847 to an officer uh, who was uh, in the war with Mexico, and it was presented to him by the by the community he lived in for raising the flag at Himatilla, and that was the battle where where Walker was killed, the Walker Colt designer with uh, Colt. So it's a fairly scarce engagement. They also engraved. Or, or, yeah, engraved on the scabbard a picture of him raising the flag on the, on the ramparts. Mm 
but the general officer sword is basically a model of 1840, just having you know some extra special groups, extra special um, features around around the langettes and guard. Okay, that takes us to the other, the last of the models of 1840. The last of the models of 1840 are the musicians and the NCO sword. And as you recall, that in 18, the 1832 foot artillery was used by NCOs until 1840. And in 1840, they came up with uh, an NCO version. Would you bring your NCO? Yeah. He's got an NCO. He's wearing it. Uh, this Van is, is, is going to walk around the room. This is a double billeted Baldrick for non commissioned officers. It was designed probably in the regulations of 1851. It was intended to hold the sword and the NCO's bayonet as well, because sergeants did carry muskets, so they needed a bayonet. Uh, this is an Ames 18, model 1840 NCO sword, dated 1864. Uh, in reasonably good condition. Yeah. I don't think a lot of these saw a lot of actual right. combat use. Thank you. Obviously, you can tell from this that um, the, the sword was not meant for the slash, it was meant for the thrust only. And uh, if Dan can now show us the, the, the difference is this one has ears and has, has a guard that is probably more practical in the family here. That is more practical in the field. The musicians doesn't have ears, it's basically just a light sword yeah. meant to be for show. This thing could actually have been used theoretically that's the difference. Like the Although we don't find many of these in Civil War sites in relic condition, but there are enough of them that have been found, so we know that they were carried. And the drags, we find a lot of drags, and drags and right. yeah. But this, uh, musicians were expected to serve on the battlefield as litter bearers, and this was their only weapon. This yeah. Toy here. Putting guys out of their misery is that the idea? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so the scabbard you can see in the middle here, uh, the, the scabbard. As it has the frog attachment that John showed you, and a, and a very simple drag. And they're made out of leather, didn't last very long. During the Civil War, there was a contract with uh, Emerson and Silver, and they actually made a scabbard out of metal, which was kind of interesting. Uh, and they, a lot of them have survived.